This is the, a series of videos produced by the Caribbean and African Health Network addressing the issues surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our communities. Introduce myself, yeah. Um, my name is Mr. Mohammed Sori Ibrahim Kamara. I am uh, an emergency medicine consultant uh, in Greater Manchester and I have been doing that for the, the past um, I'd say I graduated in uh, 1990, <laughs> so I'm a bit of a, not a novice as it were, and uh, I have been a consultant uh, since 2014, so it's still ongoing and I specialize in emergency medicine. Um, in the emergency department, we see all sorts from uh, day one to the last day of someone's living. And of course, uh, male and female, uh, with all sorts of presentations from a, a broken nail, if you imagine that, to obviously life-threatening injuries and life-threatening uh, complications of illnesses. Uh, and that's what we do on a daily basis. Uh, it can be very, um, if you like, taxing, but equally um, satisfying uh, because of the fact that you impact on people's lives. Uh, and you help them improve their lifespan or extend their lifespan if you like. And uh, obviously, when it comes to, uh, as I say, the end of life, you ensure that uh, they leave this earth um, dignified in, in the most dignified manner possible, really, Make it them, making them as comfortable as possible. So that, in a nutshell, is what we do. Now, obviously, we have this monstrosity, otherwise known as COVID-19. And I think I applaud all the uh, healthcare uh, personalities to, that are actually uh, involved uh, in, the, in the handling of this uh, unknown entity. Uh, I take my hat off to all my colleagues uh, uh, in, in doing this because we are actually risking our own lives. We're actually um, making sure that people's tomorrows are ensured by risking our todays, if that makes any sense. So we definitely want you to be able to comply with the requirements and, of course, the instructions given by uh, the specialists in order to save lives, save your lives as well as save, save ours. So that is what I think is important in this pandemic of an unknown quantity. So I've been asked to, to, to talk about uh, cardiovascular disease in COVID-19. Now, it's a big topic and uh, I think I can only try and uh, make it as compact as possible. So I thought we'd start with what cardiovascular disease is now, or cardiovascular system, because it's nice to know what it is in order to move on to what the disease looks like. So the cardiovascular system, as you know, it's otherwise called circulatory system, which means the uh, if you like, supply of blood uh, from the heart to the whole of the body and from the body back into the lungs and from the lungs back into the heart. That's how the uh, cardiovascular system works. In a sense, the cardiovascular system consists of the heart, the blood vessels, i.e. the arteries that take away clean blood or oxygenated blood, and the, the, the arteries break down into arterioles, which is smaller. And the end of that is the capillaries, which have got the, the arterial side and the venous side. So the venous side uh, will take away the, if you like, unclean blood. And, and that would then be fed onto the venules. And the venules will feed onto the veins. And the veins will come back and lead to the lungs, which is where the cleaning takes place, i.e. Uh, the oxygenation takes place, 
and then it goes through the heart for it to be supplied to the rest of the uh, the body. That's how it works. Now, obviously, um, the role is such that it, it, it supplies blood, clean blood, and then it takes away unclean blood from the used uh, organs back to the heart for it to be cleaned. And then, of course, there is things, things we call hormones and enzymes. These help us in our day-to-day -day metabolism. And so the, the cardiovascular system helps as well in uh, doing this. So that is just a quick overview of what the cardiovascular system is about. Now, obviously, there are um, risk factors in the uh, in the cardiovascular system. Uh, one of them, oh, uh, you can divide that to two sections, the ones that you can control and the ones that you can't control. Now, the ones that you can control are your weight, i.e. obesity, uh, which is prevalent in our communities. Uh, things like the blood pressure that you would have developed because of maybe the lifestyle or maybe uh, uh, hereditary factors. Uh, obviously, if you then have diabetes on board, on board with that, clearly it then compounds your risk factors, your status. Uh, and then, of course, you have you have um, diabetes, as I say. Um, you have the gender you can't control. You have the race you can't control because you can't de determine what race you're born. Uh, to what uh, gender you would be, uh, but what, and you can't control uh, your hereditary factors, but you certainly can control the blood pressure if you do have it. You can control the diabetes well if you do have it. And of course, the other illnesses that you would have, like atrial fibrillation, cardiomyopathy. Now, I don't know if I'm using the medical jargon, but obviously, uh, inflammation of the heart is cardiomyocarditis. Uh, and, and uh, that, these are things that you can control with medication and diet and exercise and uh, uh, changing your lifestyle and changing your social circumstances. So that's what I thought would be important to talk about uh, in terms of moving on from the cardiovascular system to linking it into into uh, cardiovascular diseases in COVID. So, um, I think if you can see that, I, I do have, what I did was to try and combine the two uh, elements of it. I introduced you to the cardiovascular system and then the cardiovascular disease. And what I did was to compile questions that I have been asked, you know, uh, in terms of how we cope with that. So a quick um, cap, recap of that is that the cardiovascular system is sometimes called the blood vascular system or circulatory system. It consists of the heart, which is a muscular pumping device, and is a closed system of vessels, i.e. the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. And then, of course, it includes, as I said, the blood, the heart, the right side of the heart, the left side of the heart, the blood vessels, the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins. And then there are common conditions associated with cardiovascular diseases, which we've mentioned. Coronary artery disease, heart attack, arrhythmia, that is irregular heartbeat, heart failure, the lack of functioning of the heart, uh, congenital heart defects, that things that you're born with that you may not be able to pick. Cardiomyopathy, that is, as I say, uh, an ailing heart or myocardium, the muscle of the heart. And then the last is peripheral artery disease, which you can associate with um, smoking and other things. Now, as I said, there are controllable factors and uncontrollable ones. And the uncontrollable, fact, uncontrollable factors are the male sex, which is more at risk, unfortunately. Uh, the older you get, the more likely you are to be at risk. Uh, a family history of the heart disease, which you can't control because it's, it's in the genes. And of course, for women, unfortunately, after the menopause. So being men postmenopausal obviously gives you a higher risk. And of course, us as Africans, 
Americans and Caribbeans, American Indians, Mexicans, we are all uh, at a higher risk than the Caucasian counterparts. And uh, as I say, risk factors we have are, again, the blood pressure, high blood pressure, which is hypertension. We have high cholesterol, which is hyperlipidemia. We have diabetes. We have obesity and being overweight. We have smoking. We have smoke, uh, physical inactivity. And as I said, the gender, more the male than the female. And of course, hereditary factors. Uh, that is just a quick wrap up of that, really. So what I did then was to uh, field in some questions which I thought were most important in, in, in sort of uh, trying to establish what cardiovascular disease is in the present day COVID-19. So I remember someone asking me that I have a heart condition and I am, and, and they're asking me whether they're more at risk of getting COVID-19 than somebody else who hasn't. Now, obviously, uh, an answer to that is that is no. It doesn't mean because you have a heart condition that it means you can be more prone or more susceptible to an infection. However, uh, people with underlying conditions clearly uh, might be able to, more likely to show symptoms of the infection uh, or to have the infection worse than others. The people who've also got uh, the heart conditions uh, have survived, They've actually had just a, a mild viral illness, including a sore throat, some aches and pains, and a fever. Uh, and sometimes some people develop a chest infection or a pneumonia. Uh, but we can't establish whether the heart conditions or a chest infection with COVID will make you more likely to get uh, chest infections like the flu virus or the uh, COVID-19. The next question I had was whether the risk of developing uh, the symptoms of COVID being more you know, uh, severe, similar to patients with uh, conditions, or are there any differences? Now, the answer to that is that the basis of contracting the infection is the same for all individuals. Uh, the virus, as we know, is transmitted uh, via droplets. So if someone who is infected coughs and sneezes, or talks, which is the most important thing. Someone talking close to you, you can't see what is happening to them. But when someone sneezes and coughs, obviously you will turn around and say, ah, are they covering their nose? Are they covering their mouth? And things like that. But when they're talking, you don't realize that they are what we call aerosolizing, i.e. they're droplets from the speech. And, and this is where the virus actually gets contaminated. Therefore, the need for social distancing, for three to six feet apart from someone close to you. Because the, the greater the distance between you and the person talking, the less likely that the droplets would actually fall on your face and then enter your nose or enter your eye or enter your mouth. So once it enters the virus, i.e., uh, it causes direct damage to the lungs and it triggers an inflammatory response, um, which then puts, his, puts a stress on the cardiovascular system, infecting the lungs, and obviously uh, causing uh, organs to start failing. The next question was, um, who is more at risk? Now, obviously, as I said, the immunocompromised people with HIV, people with transplants, people with cancer, people who have undergone chemotherapy and radiotherapy, uh, people with leukemia, lymphomas, heart disease, are all obviously at higher risk. Uh, other p other groups are the elderly, uh, the frails. You know, as 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 oh, as you get older, you get frailer, and uh, pregnant women as well, uh, with concomitant um, card cardiovascular disease. Uh, people, pregnant women who have got like leaking valves, for example, they are more at risk, obviously, especially closer to term. People with heart conditions such as heart failure, uh, with the myocardium being dilated. Um, people with uh, irregular heartbeat that is getting a, a strain onto the right side of the heart. And people who have got uh, congenital problems, problems they're born with, issues they're born with that they don't know about. And the children who are born with uh, uh, what we call tetra tetralogy of fallow, where they have four things wrong with the heart, like the blue baby, 
they also at very high risk. Um, people with um, cardiomyopathy, as we said, and people with implants uh, are also like pacemaker people, people with defibrillators, and people with endocarditis, and people with the leaky valves. These are all people who are more at risk. Um, I don't know if people know about Brugada syndrome, uh, but obviously people with Brugada syndrome, I think there are people in our community who do have that. They are very vulnerable to fatal arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats, uh, where the temperature exceeds 39 degrees. So if someone is getting a, a temperature that's getting beyond 38, they need to be either taking paracetamol, trying to bring it down, or better still, phoning 111. Uh, in order to get that down, because if you have Brugada syndrome, that would obviously make it worse. Um, the other group is people with irregular heartbeat, which we call atrial fibrillation. Now, in itself, atrial fibrillation, it doesn't increase the risk of defection, but nevertheless, uh, people with atrial infection, uh, uh, fibrillation, are people who are older. In fact, 80% of the 80 year olds do have an irregular heartbeat, but they don't know about it until they develop a chest infection. And then when you see the electrocardiogram, that is the heart tracing that we do in the hospital, you then see that they have irregular heartbeat, which they never know about. And the danger of the irregular heartbeat is that the blood doesn't flow as smoothly as it should through the vessels, and therefore it's prone to clot. And if it clots, then it causes um, things like um, embolism, i.e. blood clot. And the blood clot can be in the lungs, and that would cause problems with uh, oxygenation and therefore can cause uh, problems with the, uh, the heart, which can then cause, lead to cardiac arrest. So such people uh, need to have blood thinners to help them with the circulation to the blood to flow a lot better, a lot smoother, you know, in order to prevent any clot formation. So such people definitely are uh, in itself, not, as I said, atrial fibrillation itself doesn't cause more of a risk. However, if you're older and you have other illnesses like heart failure, blood pressure, and to add to that diabetes, you definitely are at a higher risk compared to somebody who's just got atrial fibrillation. Next one was uh, people were reading about coronavirus and the causing or the, the, the causative uh, connection between the heart problems and a heart attack or arrhythmias. Uh, but as I say, based on the inflammatory effects of the virus, there are theoretical risks that the viral infection could cause rupture of that uh, fatty deposit that we have uh, in our arteries, in the, the ones that supply the heart, which will lead to acute coronary syndrome, which is otherwise known as angina, that would lead to a heart attack. So if people experience uh, severe chest pain or chest discomfort um, when they have symptoms of the coronavirus, they should be obviously uh, calling for support, i.e. phoning 111 immediately to be transferred to hospital because that can lead to a heart attack. The next one is uh, cardiac patients who have diabetes and or hypertension. I think we touched on that already. Based on data from China uh, where the disease started, uh, there are indications that a significant proportion of the ones that unfortunately die, uh, died as well, uh, are, are those who developed a severe disease and had underlying health issues, i.e. comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension. The exact re reason for this is unclear, uh, but it's likely that hypertension and diabetes are prevalent in the general population at the age of over 70 or 70 plus, where the mortality of the COVID-19 is really at its highest. Uh, there has been an article uh, which links this uh, medication that people with hypertension take. It is called uh, angiotensin inhibitors, things like lisinopril and um, ramipril, which I know most of our people are on. But it's important to emphasize that this is a theory which has not been confirmed. It's not been substantiated at all by any uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, but obviously, the, the British uh, Cardiac Society uh, and the American ones, as well as the European ones, advised that the benefits of taking your tablets already that you're on uh, far outweigh the risks of not taking it if you have COVID. So it doesn't mean because you have COVID, you should stop taking 
uh, your 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 medication because that would cause problems. So please, 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 and pretty please, if you're having those or you're taking them, please continue to take them. If you have any questions or queries or uncertainties, you need to be getting in touch with either your GP or ringing 111. Next question. There are reports that COVID-19 may induce what we call myocarditis or pericarditis. This is where the covering of the heart or the mus muscular layer of the heart gets inflamed. Uh, and then people who've had it previously I've been told that they're more vulnerable to contracting it maybe a second time, a third time. I must admit that there's been no uh, scientific, scientific evidence that an individual who's had it previously is at a higher risk than someone who's never had it. Uh, it is recognized that some cases of myocarditis have a relapsing and remitting cause, that is they go up and down, it flares up and then it goes into remission. Uh, but as I speak, there's no evidence that the virus responsible for COVID-19 infects the heart. However, you have something we call acute inflammatory response, which happens when a bug enters the body. Uh, and obviously that can worsen the functioning of the heart and it can actually worsen the symptoms of someone who has got heart failure. People with heart disease, they question me, are they more likely to die than those without? Uh, well, as I say, the answer is, we, we don't know that there's any evidence to support. But what we know is that older people and those that have underlying conditions, including the heart conditions, uh, have been you know, uh, more at risk, really. But it's important to emphasize that most questions, uh, most patients, even those with underlying heart disease, have had mild infections and have fully recovered. The next one is, um, People are thinking about uh, going to the hospital. Uh, they're saying, I know that I should not go to the hospital if I think I'm infected. But when should I seek medical attention if I have a pre-existing heart condition? Now, if you think you have COVID-19 infection, i.e. you're getting the symptoms, ask yourself, can you manage the symptoms at home? Because if you have fever, just a fever, you can manage that at home by just taking paracetamol. But if you don't feel comfortable in managing this, then clearly you need to be seeking medical help, particularly if you're short of breath. Of all the systems in the body, the system that would actually take you out, i.e. will cause death uh, sooner than later, is the respiratory system. So if someone says, I can't breathe, someone is short of breath, difficulty is breathing, wheezing, that person should be seeking medical help immediately. And that is vital, that is important. There's also a rumor that people who take anti-inflammatories, the likes of ibuprofen, indomethacin, uh, naproxen, were more at risk and that would actually worsen their symptoms to the extent it can actually disable them and maybe cause death. Well, so far, we haven't got any evidence to support that or to substantiate that, uh, if you like, that rumor or hypothesis. Therefore, if you need to be taking them, please continue to take them. However, if you have asthma, you're gonna be really careful because um, people who are asthmatic, not all of them, some of them, do have sometimes a reaction to anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, like I mentioned. So if you are one of those, then I suggest you refrain from taking that. Uh, obviously, the next point, part of it is safe, staying safe at home. The questions that I received on this uh, are that whether there are any additional measures that can be taken uh, to limit the risk of getting sick uh, if the person has got a heart condition. Obviously, depending on the country you live in, you have to follow uh, the guidelines because they vary from country to country. Uh, but obviously, one thing or some of the things that people can do to actually uh, minimize the possibility of getting infected are to avoid crowds. So if you know someone is sick, someone is unwell, try and avoid them, try and distance yourself away from them, especially the elderly, you know, and visiting, obviously like we want to visit our parents and our, our relatives and all that, but we have to understand that in this particular situation, we may be the enemy and therefore we are bringing the illness to them. So if you want to keep them safe, we need to actually avoid where there's, you know, a crowd. Uh, it's not without reason 
that even in the saddest of circumstances where someone has lost a loved one, in, during the burial, you only allowed maybe up to 10 people because the more uh, people confluence or converge, the more likely that you could actually um, pass on this illness without knowing you've done so, especially the person who hasn't got the symptoms. So they've got it. They don't have any symptoms to show, but then they don't know they have it. And yet they have it and they're passing it from one person to another. These are the ones that are termed uh, super spreaders. So these are the ones you want to avoid. And you can't tell by looking at somebody's face whether this person has got it. No, unless they sneeze, they cough and things like that. And by which time, obviously, they will be at home. But the person that doesn't have it, that is the person you want to avoid. And as I said, unfortunately, there's nothing on the mind on the face to say, I have got it. Therefore, you have to be safe by distancing. Uh, as I said, three to six uh, feet away from one another. Wash your hands thoroughly with warm water and soap at least for 20 seconds and as frequently as possible. Uh, if you cough, obviously cover your mouth. Uh, but usually it's better for you to cough into the inside of your elbow. Uh, cover your nose with a tissue and when you sneeze or cough. And uh, if you do use a tissue, then make sure you put this tissue straight away in the bin and thereafter wash your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose and your mouth because that's how you transmit the illness. The more often you touch your nose, the, the more likely you are to infect yourself. The other thing is try and um, touch less of the the doors, the handles, you know, and things like that, because that's where this thing actually continues to reside. Clean the surfaces, the, no the door knobs, the handles, the steering wheels, the light switches uh, with disinfectant to remove the virus as best you can. Stay as, that's it, stay at home as much as possible, including if you're a high risk or, you know, you don't necessarily have to come to work, to the workplace, then work from home if this is feasible. If you have a fever, or a temperature of 37.8 or above, or you've got a cough, or maybe you are you know, bringing up phlegm, then you should be self-isolating, in which case you have to do so for seven days. And for the people who are caring for you, they have to be isolating for 14 days, because as you know, the incubation period is between two to 14 days. So if someone is symptomatic, by the time they get to the fifth day, they're less infectious. So by the seventh day, they're less infectious and they would have been fighting it uh, and creating antibodies in their bodies. Whereas the person who has not been symptomatic yet would not know they have this illness until after 14 days. Uh, another person asked, I had the flu and, uh, and the, the pneumonia vaccine this year. And they're asking me, am I protected from this virus? Well, I would say no, because the vaccines against pneumonia uh, uh, against a, a bug we call pneumococcus. And, and the flu vaccine is definitely not the same as the coronavirus. Uh, people always ask me, well, how many types do you have? Well, there are four types of the, uh, the, 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 the coronaviruses. There's the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta. Of them, the alpha is where you have the flu, which, as I say, you can actually ride depending on what your immune system is like. If it's very robust, you might just get mild symptoms. But as I say, flu itself can kill. However, you have the beta uh, subgroup, which is where the danger lies. They are the ones that are the coronaviruses, and there are six that were known to the world. Uh, this is the seventh one. So uh, the vaccine against uh, the pneumonia and, of course, the flu will not be effective against the COVID-19. However, there are... Uh, um, trials, you know, research ongoing now. And sadly, even if they get a vaccine that is effective against COVID-19, it can't be available within six months. It probably at the very earliest, you're looking at a year for that to happen. But the flu and the pneumonia vaccine does not protect you from this virus. Uh, and people were asking me whether they should be wearing masks to protect themselves from the virus. Now, obviously, for the general population, wearing a mask is only recommended if you are experiencing the symptoms, i.e. you've got a cough, you've got a fever, and you're caring for somebody with these symptoms, like myself as a doc. When I go to see a patient, whether they have the symptoms or not, I go with a mask, I go with a, an apron, a pinny, the plastic bit, and I go with gloves. 
because as I say, I need to protect myself. And if I have it, I need to prevent myself giving it to my patients. Therefore, every patient that I see, I have to be gowned, I have to be masked, and I have to have gloves. Yeah, and if I'm moving from an area where the ones with COVID are, and I'm going to another area uh, that hasn't, that the, the ones with no COVID are, I still wear a mask. However, when I move from the area where the COVID patients are, I then change my mask because otherwise I'll be cross-contaminating the patients who don't have it. So I change my mask, I change my apron, I change my gloves and go on to see somebody who hasn't got it. Yeah. So someone who's wearing, who's got a heart condition, it is not recommended that you wear a mask as probably you might suffocate yourself. These masks are really uncomfortable and they have some material in them which can sometimes cause you more difficulties breathing. So if you have a heart condition and you're concerned about wearing the mask and things like that, then maybe you might be needing to speak to your doctor uh, because if you continue to use these masks like we are doing, clearly we'll run out of them. And if we run out of them, then clearly we don't have enough time to replace them, which then puts people more at risk. So we always have to use these things judiciously as best we can, but at the same time, protecting ourselves. Um, the next question was uh, whether vitamins uh, or food supplements uh, would help protect against the COVID-19. Now, as I say, taking vitamins is not a bad thing. There have been several agents that have been trialed, like vitamin C, ascorbic acid, uh, hydro Quinone has been trialed, and antivirals have been tried as well. Uh, the effects are not, uh, I'd say, impactful at all on the course of this illness. But obviously, natural vitamins, which we get from fresh vegetables and a balanced diet plus exercise, are the best way to improve or to boost the immune system. Uh, fruits contain, you know, a large supply of nutrients like kiwi fruit pomegranate, uh, and vegetables like broccoli, watermelon, uh, fruits as well. These are all things that would help. And as I say, the more natural things you eat, the better it is. Pills, they're okay, but pills cannot replace the natural uh, um, uh, elements that we have, the natural foodstuff that we do have. These are the best to help with somebody who's got heart trouble. Uh, there was also the question, people were worried that if they've had it once, can they have it again? Now, the current research that we do have does say that you do develop some immunity to COVID-19 after the first infection. So the possibility of catching it again is still out there. I can't say you can't catch it, but the likelihood of catching it is quite minimal because after the first uh, bout of it, you'd have developed some antibodies which would stand you in good stead should you be exposed to the virus subsequently. Uh, obviously, there are examples of viruses like the flu or the common cold, which can be contracted more than once because of the way the virus changes. Remember, the COVID-19 is one of the RNA viruses, and they have this distinct uh, ability or characteristic of actually uh, mutating, changing themselves. So imagine you've got a, a vaccine against the COVID-19 in the state A, and now it changes itself into state B. So obviously that vaccine doesn't cover it, and therefore there is the distinct possibility of contracting B instead of A. However, because A and B have something common, the possibility of you experiencing worse symptoms is quite minimal because you do have the antibodies in place. Uh, medication, again, people talked about it. Should I change any of, any of my heart medication? Again, the benefits do outweigh the risks. It's always important if you have any doubts, then clearly you need to be discussing this with the specialist who would give you the appropriate advice. That does not include if you're having an allergic reaction to it, which is a separate topic, and I don't want to digress, but clearly if you are put on medication for a heart condition, blood pressure, diabetes, and all the heart attack that you would have had, or a stroke, you need not stop taking these. Let nobody tell you that if you stop taking them, you would definitely be better. That is wrong, that is ill-advised. 
you definitely need to continue taking them. If you have any worries or any queries, any doubts, by all means, please, 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 and pretty please refer to the specialist and they would advise you accordingly. Uh, in the news, we've had reports about medication, you know, uh, given to some COVID patients, which could cause dangerous arrhythmias. Uh, what, do, what do people need to know? I was asked. Uh, people with the long QT syndrome, obviously, make, make, they need to make sure that they're attending a uh, physician or the doctor that, that is looking after them is aware of the heart condition. Uh, if they get admitted to hospital, they need to notify the doctors there. You know, the long QT, which is an inherited condition uh, where there's a delay of the heart signals, uh, which makes people vulnerable to irregular heartbeats. Um, if they have that, then clearly uh, they need to be making the, the doctors aware because something like chloroquine, which has been bandied about, they say it's very good, an anti-malaria agent, it can actually cause problems with the heart and can really be fatal. So therefore, chloroquine, I'd advise you not to take it all because there's no evidence that it does help with COVID-19. Um, there are other medications that can actually lengthen the, the QT interval, which would uh, be the way the heart beats, something like uh, amitriptyline, the tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, you know, people who've got uh, irregular heartbeat, uh, anti, uh, atrial fibrillation and depression need to be very careful because if you overdose on those and you've got COVID, it can actually lead to some very uh, uncomfortable situation which can sometimes be fatal. If you need to be admitted to hospital, remember to take a complete and up-to-date list of all your medications so it doesn't create any problems or any issues. Because remember, it's a very tense situation. And if you don't let the doctors know, errors can be committed or errors can be made, and that can lead to catastrophic consequences. So therefore, please, please, please take these with you and make sure it's complete. Uh, therefore, I can't advise you any or can't emphasize it any more than I'm doing just to prevent any uh, unsolicited uh, errors happening. Uh, staying safe indoors. Uh, the question was asked, am I safe outside of the house? Uh, provided I avoid crowded places, uh, can I go for a walk outside? Well, of course, yeah. The virus, as I say, is contracted or caught from people who have the infection. And so there's no problem going outside by yourself. You can go into the garden. You've got music and maybe some food there, or whatever. You can do that. You can walk about, you can run about, no questions about that. Uh, but of course, the most important thing is to avoid someone who might be ill. Um, if events bring together a lot of people, i.e. you've got more than 10 people or maybe people are very close together, then probably try and avoid those. It's not without reason that even exams for students medical students and other students have been cancelled. School has been cancelled because the more, the crowdier the, uh, the area is, the more likely that the, um, if you like, the, 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 the spreading of this virus is, is increased. It's as simple as that. Therefore, that social distancing is very, very important, absolutely vital in trying to ensure that the number of infectious, infections or the number of people who contract the disease would be minimized. Because the virus is a non-living organism. It doesn't live or survive outside a living body. So if it's outside in the atmosphere, as long as a living body doesn't inhale it or doesn't go into it, it will die. It's as simple as that. So the less people are together, the more likely that the virus would, would die its natural death. And once it dies, the likelihood of contracting it is very, very limited. So that way, you see the reduction or the flattening of that curve we're talking about. And the less the, the infection, the more likely that would have people going about in their normal business without having to worry about what happens next. People are asking me whether they can still travel or use public transport. Now, that is very interesting because as the lockdown suggests, there's only necessary traveling that is required. Uh, but obviously, depending on the country where you are, if they have the, the rules have been relaxed or you don't have a total lockdown, then you need to be abiding by, you know, the rules or guidelines of that country. Um, that's all I can say. But obviously, in the public transports, people are, you know, are there breathing on one another and they're close to one another. And so obviously the chance of you contracting, the chances of you contracting that are far higher than if you're in your own car. And even in your own car, if you are in the front, 
and someone is in the back, the likelihood of contracting is less compared to somebody who's next to you in the front or the other person who's in the back. It's not without reason that even in the future, people are suggesting that in planes, instead of being, you know, like sardines, people would have to be, you know, sort of uh, seated in a way whereby there's more leg room and there's three, uh, if you like, feet apart, uh, which obviously will make things more expensive, but at least you are safer. Uh, staying well, people have asked, because obviously in the midst of all this, there are the mental problems, the psychological problems and all that. People have got anxiety, you know. Uh, is there anything that they can do to make them feel better? As I say, even for us doctors, healthcare personnel is a very anxious time for everyone, including myself. Every day I leave home and go to work, I have this at the back of my mind. Could this be the day that I would actually be getting this thing and bringing it to my family or not. And bear in mind, unfortunately, if you've contracted it, there's no way of knowing until after 14 days, not unless you were symptomatic. And usually the symptoms develop between three to five days. So, so that's the situation with it. We're all anxious, but we're doing our best and we're all in this together and we're coping as best we can. If you eat well and you, you eat regularly and healthily, then you will be able to keep your bodily strength up and, and the good food also provides you with the, vit the vital vitamins and the minerals that you need to combat anxiety. You know, things like whole grains, fruit, vegetables uh, will work away like magic. You know, they work their magic and, uh, and, and the anxiety levels will obviously drop. Drink plenty of water and uh, sometimes juices, a nice cup of tea or coffee in a quiet place is also, as I say, surprisingly helpful for calming and soothing the nerves. Uh, exercise is absolutely vital. You know, you can be indoors and just, you know, up and down or maybe in the garden or somewhere in the conservatory or anywhere, you know, even walking or brisk walking or jogging or uh, cycling is important to keep the mind, you know, uh, sane. And of course, you can do virtual uh, socializing you know, FaceTiming, Skyping friends and family, people that you've never met for a long, long time or you haven't met for a long time, you could actually, you know, do that. Learn a new language, you can do that. You know, learn a new trade whilst you're sitting there, that would help you. You know, uh, it does surprisingly support people and it reduces uh, anxiety. Uh, stay busy with the chores, maybe get some DIY and things like that. Recreational activities, listen to music, uh, read a book, tackle crosswords, knitting, you know, if you can sew or maybe paint or draw. These are all activities that would help the well-being. Uh, avoid negative messaging. Now, this is important. Absolutely vital because negative thoughts and negative messaging can only lead to negative stress and the negative stress can only lead to uh, increasing the blood pressure and that would then lead to you being more vulnerable uh, to the COVID-19. And of course, breathing exercises are vital. Uh, people who suffer with anxiety know that breathing is invaluable. If you do take, you feel anxious, obviously, uh, take a deep breath in, count to five, and breathe out slowly to, to, uh, to a count of 10. Uh, do this several times a day, or several times when you're feeling the anxious moments, and that would help you to calm down. Um, I think I've stopped so far because I'm conscious of the time. But thank you for having me, and I'm happy to field any questions. Thanks, Doc. Right. Th th thanks for that elaborate, detailed presentation. We're now going to take questions. D Doretta, did you have anything to ask or add? Hi, yes, um, hello there. Thank you very much, Doctor, for that information. Very, very important, what you've said. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you, um, Doctor, is that, you know, a lot of people cover their mouth and they cover their nose, but what about the ears? Because when you look at ear, nose and throat, things can go in through the ears and that's where we swallow through and it comes down the side, as it comes down the side of your throat through the in when it comes through your ears. Does that not also affect through here? and it comes down through these glands that are down by the side that will then come into the throat, the chest, and cause more problems. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the ear. Now, obviously, there's a, uh, something we call the eustachian tube uh, that mm -hmm. connects the ear to the throat. Um, 
very unlikely that you'd have the virus going down the ear. You're more likely to have the virus coming through the nose and through the mouth into the throat because this particular virus prefers the airway, the upper respiratory tract. You know, uh, the likelihood of it being through the ears is very, very minimal. I don't think that is even likely because you have the tube. Normally, people who've got like tonsillitis, uh, people who have got like middle ear infection, then obviously the, the, the infection can track its way into the throat. That's right, yes. Yeah, so, so, so mainly it's actually touching of the face, the eyes, the nose and the mouth. These are the main ways that uh, uh, this virus is actually transmitted. And the more you touch the face, the more likely that is supposed you know, to be the case in terms of transmission. But mm -hmm. this is why they say uh, they advise you to touch uh, the doors. If you're opening your doors, they advise you to use the non-dominant hand. So in yes. the event that it is on those objects like the door knobs and door handles, you are unlikely or very less likely to touch your face using your non-dominant hand. Do you see what I'm saying? So thereby yes. minimizing. And if the virus stays longer, obviously by washing your hands, you'll be disintegrating this virus and therefore lessening the chances of infection. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I have another question if we have time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I was asking, um, Doctor, um, you know about the breathing, the cardiovascular and the way that people breathe. We, we're standing up and we're doing, I think that we should be looking at breathing techniques as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's either and lying on your side and learning to, to breathe, inhale and exhale and changing different sides and then lying on your back, then lying on your front. Because that way I feel, I don't know if I'm right, but it helps to strengthen your diaphragm and also helps you to learn how to lift your rib cage to allow the lungs to expand in different positions because I'm finding that when people go into hospital they're laying flat on their back and surely that can't be good because it's concave and flattening the chest that they can't lift so maybe if they turn on their sides and learn to breathe that way I, I don't know I'm just asking the question because I just feel like lying on your back can sort of like make things worse you make a good point. Um, I just wanted to buttress that. Now, uh, we've, got, we've got what we call awake proning. What's that? I don't know if that makes any sense or maybe you've not heard of that. When no, people are unwell and the lungs are full of maybe fluid or in this case, it looks like mucus that is as thick as glass, they obviously cannot uh, conduct what we call that uh, oxygenation. They can't, you know, get the oxygen that we need for us to function properly. Therefore, they get prone, so they're mm -hmm. turned to their front. So the person can be uh, asleep, i.e. the machine breathing for them, yeah. or they're on their front. That's what we call proning. But well, that is proning when the person is asleep, i.e. Uh, put in an induced coma. However, okay. it has been known that uh, the awake proning has made significant differences to people, especially those with um, you know, chest and heart trouble. Yes. What we do when they come to us is we, if they're short of breath, difficulties breathing, they're wheezy, uh, we give them a nebulizer mm -hmm. and then we ask them if they're capable, if they're able to tolerate it, to lay on their front for like five minutes, 10 minutes, and you find the oxygen saturations after that, you know, do get better, they get improved and people feel better and they can go home. Now, there are breathing techniques as well. The way I know it, I've got a colleague down in London who sent a video, and maybe I'll send it to Charles later on for people to share and uh, use. You actually will take a breath in and hold your breath for five seconds and breathe out. Yes. Yeah, and then you do that five times. And on the sixth time you do it, you take twice as long, so 10 seconds. And yeah. after you, you get that 10 seconds in, holding it in, when you're actually releasing the breath, uh, you then use you, the crook of your arm, the inside of the elbow, and probably cuff into, in the, into that elbow, the inside of the elbow, so that it helps you to expand the lung, just like you said. And then mm -hmm. after that, you then lie on your front for like five, 10 minutes, and that helps the lungs to irate. It helps the lungs to expand, and it helps the lung to take away any of the muck or the gunk that you would have. It's a mm -hmm. bit like you having uh, somebody with cystic fibrosis. I don't know if you know about that. That mm -hmm. massage where they tap yes, into the back, right, yes. and then you get the, the, the muck coming out, and that helps people you know, improve their breathing. 
So mm -hmm. that's one thing that is important. If Charles wants to, I can share that video with you okay. and you can then use it as best you can. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Two questions and yeah. So our apologies for the time. Give us about five minutes extra or so. So two questions, one from Lizo. In your experience, do patients who are admitted through A&E have a worse outcome than those who have been referred by their GPs? And then the second question is whether COVID-19 is viral, I mean, whether the virus is airborne? Well, the first question um, is whether the comparison between the ones referred by the GP uh, to the ones that come to A&E. Now, <laughs> it's very, I don't know whether it's a simple short answer or a long answer. The, the short answer obviously is such that we advise people not to come to hospital, not unless they're in dire straits, because the reason being that when they come to hospital, they obviously will spread the virus. That does not mean that if you're feeling worse for wear, you shouldn't come to hospital. I repeat, if you can't control your symptoms, there's a dedicated line. You can ring and uh, I think it's 111. And that person at the other end will uh, sort of uh, put in or input your symptoms and come up with a, a, a chance or a percentage of whether you are somebody who needs to be in hospital or not. So if you're referred clearly, what we do is assess you, do a chest x-ray, and obviously do some blood tests and see what you have. And we then decide whether you need to come in or whether you need to go back with some treatment. So the comparison between those that were referred by the GP to the ones that come to A&E, clearly the ones that come to A&E are the ones that are really unwell. The ones uh, that get retained or maybe admitted to hospital, well, clearly we know that they can't cope at home. Otherwise, if they go home, they would definitely die. Therefore, they keep them in and treat them as best we can. And if at all the need uh, mandates that they need to be put into an induced coma in order for the lungs to improve in terms of functionality, then clearly that's what we will do. As you, could, you must have heard that ventilators were in short supply uh, because of that, because when people are put to sleep, they have to have that ventilator breathing for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. But these are people whose lungs are so badly infected that they can't uh, survive otherwise. Therefore, they need to be kept in hospital. Whether it be the ones that have come from the GP or the ones that have come to the A&E is, is difficult to say. I don't think there's any because the GP will be monitoring symptoms and they can then refer them when they know they're not coping well or they're deteriorating. The same applies to someone who would come in. I remember my first COVID patient uh, who thankfully is still miraculously alive uh, against all the odds, you know, uh, he's still alive. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, even as a medic, I was astonished uh, as to the resilience of this uh, individual and how they've coped. But they came to the hospital having been treated for a water infection by the GP. They've had antibiotics. And for some reason, he felt unwell in terms of breathing. He was short of breath. He came to us. And when we looked at him, the oxygen saturation was 70%, and the norm is between 92 and 98, yeah, or 96, depending on who the person is. So this person on 15 liters of oxygen was saturating at 70%, so that just to tell you. And he was as alert as anything else. When we looked at it, we thought, hang on, that's not right. And then we did the blood test, and that confirmed that this man is not well. And obviously, when we looked at the chest x-ray we did subsequently, we found out, man, this guy cannot go home, otherwise he'll die. So we had to keep him in and admit him. Now, you may say that might be in the minority. But as I say, if you do have symptoms, whether you're from the GP or you're coming directly from uh, 111, I don't think there's any difference in terms of who comes because the GP would have been monitoring symptoms. So if that answers it or not. What was the second question again? The Remind question me. It's about whether the virus is airborne. Well, my understanding of airborne is like if you have a chemical that is sprayed in the air and everybody will get it. Now, as far as I know, this virus is spread by the droplets. Yeah. So it comes from the person who's speaking to you in close proximity and not airborne as, as it is. If you spray a chemical in the air, all the people who will be there would get that chemical. Whereas with the COVID, it's more whoever is close to you and has got it and is actually spreading it without knowing they have it. So it's more a droplet uh, transmission. 
rather than airborne. Okay, Doc. Doc, th- th- there is a video circulating, you know, via WhatsApp about uh, conspiracies. And, and there is a lady, you know, in the US, a, a virologist who is gotten a couple of people together. And, and what they're saying is using masks will put you more at risk. And by washing your hands frequently, you're not building your immune system. I mean, what would you have to say about that? Because I think <laughs> lots of conspiracies out there. Well, I mean, obviously, with everything, you've got conspiracy theories. When Ebola broke out in West Africa, there were so many conspiracy theories about, a, you know, a biochemical weapon that was prepared in the labs and blah, blah, blah. And it's now being used to exterminate our people, you know, to depopulate Africa and all that. It's difficult. I didn't go to medical school for that. I always tell people, um, if you're washing your hands and by so doing, you're not building your immunity, well, I think that is dangerous because it has been found. The reason why I say that is I'm not saying washing your hands in everything else is uh, got a, a positive tone to it or negative tone to it. What I'm saying is this particular virus has got a lipid envelope there's three parts to this virus that middle part which is the lipid which is the oil-based envelope can only be taken care of by washing the hands and as i said somebody asked me uh, in during my bbc interview whether using cold water instead of warm water uh, would bear any you know effect or any differences i say uh, using cold water comes a distant third because if you dip your hands in oil and you want to wash your hands in cold water, you see what happens. The likelihood of you thoroughly washing your hands and without the fingers or the hands being slippery is very, very, very slim. Whereas if you use warm water and you use the soap, clearly the soap and the water, when it's warm, makes and the stains and the rest of it come, you know, come off a lot quicker and a lot better. Therefore, the need for the warm water. And it's not just washing uh, the, the, the hands uh, with the warm water and the soap you also need a duration so for you to disintegrate this virus you need to be washing the hands with the warm water and soap for 20 seconds that does help because the less of the uh, the virus you have on your hands or on your body the less likely you are to transfer that onto your face your nose and your eyes when you touch them remember when you get to contact or when you come into contact with this virus it will take you 14 days, remember. If it's a situation whereby you contact it today and you then have the symptoms today, clearly it's a different thing. But you need 14 days, which is the incubation period. Therefore, it is advisable to continually and more frequently wash your hands with warm water and soap. Conspiracy theory or not, I can't advise you that by washing your hands, you'll be reducing your immunity because this virus is real. It's absolutely causing mayhem which is unfolding. It's a dynamic situation, and I cannot emphasize it any more than I am, that if someone tells you you're not building the, your immunity, well, I can't subscribe to that. The other thing I can tell you that is in our favor is that the death rate, this is why it becomes important, the death rate of this virus, even though it's as dangerous as it is, as it is, is 2 to 3%. Do you see what I mean? So if you can minimize that, then that would be good. Apart from that, the immune system itself will fight its own battles. Remember that. So if we had like the MERS virus, which you get from the, uh, the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, people go to Hajj and Umrah. When they come back and they have that, the fatality or the mortality rate is up to 38%. Can you imagine that? So, so it just tells you that if you wash your hands properly, you eat well, you distance yourself. Yeah. And obviously, if you're infected, you self-isolate. And if you're high risk, you shield your likelihood of contracting this dangerous monster is quite slim. Thank you for that, Doc. Two, two things. I mean, one, there have been, you know, someone has asked a question about the BAME community and we being told we are disproportionately impacted. So what, what can you say to that? The other, well, other, other perception or other anecdotal, you know, stuff we've heard uh, that, you know, black people like yourself on the front line are more likely to be, you know, discriminated against when it comes to PPE. I mean, yes, you work in Thameside, which is part of Greater Manchester. What has been your experience on the front line? And, and you've mentioned earlier on treating COVID-19 patients. 
you know, can you give some reflections? Well, I, I mean, I'll take the latter part um, first. The, the obviously, um, if anybody says that we're being discriminated against in terms of uh, availability of PPEs because we are of the BAME community, I disagree with that. I don't think there's anything there that would actually, you know, be be, be highlighted as uh, discrimination uh, because that's what it is. I don't think that's the case. I disagree with that, you know, totally. There's no chance of that happening. The PPEs are in short supply for each and everybody. Whatever, whatever the denomination you are, whatever race you are, the PPEs are in short supply because clearly the preparedness of the UK and the world was at its lowest. Nobody expected this thing. And even if, even if they expected it, they weren't that well prepared. And even when they knew about it, they weren't, you know, thinking about it being as big, as enormous as it is. So clearly the, 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 the issue with uh, PPE availability. But to say that we as BAME representatives are discriminated against, therefore we have less of it, I think I disagree with that. The first part, obviously, is to do with the fact that the BAME representatives, as you see, in the media and all that is obviously disproportionately affected by this monster. Yeah, I call it that. Because of the issues that I actually highlighted at the very beginning, yeah, uh, the likelihood of finding large families is more prevalent in the BAME community. I mean, I have colleagues who've got like eight kids, and if you're living in a two-bedroom house or three-bedroom house with eight children, overcrowding is a big factor, yeah? People with underlying issues that they weren't aware of, are you with me? Uh, they would have had, you know, cardiovascular issues that maybe they didn't have the facilities to, uh, if you like, detect or investigate and therefore are not on medication uh, to so, you know, sort of curb that or maybe put that at a lower minimum, yeah? So therefore, it makes you more vulnerable. Clearly, the, um, the hereditary factors that we do have are also another issue that we can control. The other thing that is, if you imagine in London you have high-rise buildings, uh, you know, socioeconomic factors, people that live there are mainly the ones that are, uh, if you like, impoverished, people of a lower economic strata or social strata uh, level. And therefore, you find these people are living in close proximity, and of course, the spread, as we know, is, uh, you know, uh, droplets. So it spreads like wildfire without even knowing it. And as I said, the, 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 the super spreader is what you're concerned about. That's what you really need to guard against. So amongst the BAME community, we find that people who work in the front line are prevalent, as you know. And therefore, we're more exposed. There's no questions about that. So if we have underlying factors, underlying risk factors, and we're working in the front line, plus the fact that we have larger families, we then don't look after ourselves as we should. We're working seven days a week because we have to look after our loved ones back home. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this itself, you know, takes its toll on people. The sleeplessness, you know, uh, the immune system is impacted on that. And, and so obviously the low the immune system, the more likely you are to be vulnerable to this illness. But if you then have a balanced lifestyle, i.e. fruit, exercise, uh, a healthy diet, plus uh, a balanced uh, home and work uh, environment, clearly the chances are, uh, of you contracting this illness are quite slim. And to add it to that, you have the low percentage mortality rate because people you know, get well in themselves. Some mild symptoms, some severe. But that's the way things are. There are factors that are prevalent in the BAME community that puts them at a more susceptible level in comparison to the Caucasians. Th th thanks, Doc. We we've got two or three more questions and then we, we will be wrapping up. So we, we delighted at Khan that when we have the health, uh, it's black doctors that we bring on board. And so there's a question about PPE and fitting them. Is there any criteria, you know, I mean, when they, they, they fit in a PPE, do they use people like, you know, ourselves? Also, there's a question around ventilation. You know, is there any criteria that perhaps doesn't go in the favor of black people because of the underlying health conditions you've mentioned? And then is there anything from your experience about late presentation? So the fear that 
you know, maybe our people might have a, a contracting COVID. So therefore, do not present early. And then the final one is around resuscitation and whether you could comment on, you know, the laws around that or, or what the criteria is. Uh, give me the, the first one again, please. Sorry. So the first one is about PPE and whether they fit it for black people. Well, I mean, PPE, there's nothing written that whether black, white, or, or if you like, Hispanic, there's nothing there. Uh, obviously, there are people, whether they're Caucasian or of the BAME uh, community, who have got certain anatomical, uh, if you like, uh, dimensions of their faces that it doesn't matter what you do, would not be able to pass that fit testing. That's one thing. People with beards. Uh, cannot be tested and be absolutely sure that indeed uh, there's no possibility of transmission or maybe contracting the virus when you are in the midst of uh, treating or maybe uh, executing your duties as a healthcare personnel. So you have to be fit tested. There are machines that do that. I prefer the machine one because the machine uh, does look at the fitting. It makes you move your head left, right and center and up and down and talk whilst it's assessing whilst assessing your, your, fit, your fitness, i.e. How, how best fitted it is. And if you don't score 95%, you will fail. There are others that are done by uh, other healthcare personnel who are trained to do so, who would then uh, spray something in the, in the mouth uh, whilst you're having a hood to see whether you can taste it and smell it. That can be a bit suspect depending on who. There's no foolproof plan that, or a confirmation that this would not let some other people, you know, me you know exposed unnecessarily however the machine one is preferable that is definitely guaranteed because when i got test fitted uh, i actually passed with that one the other one i didn't pass so in effect i have mine which is personalized which i use when i need to use it the second one second question it is around the criteria for ventilation yeah well that's a big subject i don't know if we're able to exhaust that but just for, 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 for the purposes of time, a constraint, um, for us to actually ventilate somebody, it would mean that the state of the lungs is such that it can't carry the functions of oxygenation, which is what is required. And in that case, they need to be ventilated in order to allow for the lungs to heal to a certain level where they will then be able to carry out the function as it were before the person became ill. And the best people to actually conduct this are the anaesthetists. We can suggest, but they're the ones that the specialists in uh, the airway, that's their specialty. So they will look at the parameters and the indications and the possibilities of success uh, that uh, would requ are required in order for people to be ventilated. i give you an example again, like the man that I saw, the patient that I saw, he came well. Looking at him, you wouldn't have thought he has got a 70% saturation. And when we increase the, the oxygen in the, you know, capacity, the oxygen in the, in, the, in, in the department to 15 liters, which is the highest, he still was saturating at 70%. Now, when we looked at the x-ray of the chest, we then decided that this man has to be ventilated. And luckily, as I say, it's a happy ending because although he's still uh, a patient, but he's definitely out of uh, danger now because the lungs that he, that he has now he are in a better situation to cope with the day-to-day -day, uh, requirements. But if they're not, then they have to be uh, uh, put into an induced coma where the lungs are allowed to, to get better in order to be able to perform the function as it were before they got ill. The third one? Yeah, th it's around resuscitation. Yeah. Resuscitation, I don't know whether people understand what that means. It's trying to uh, either keep someone alive or someone who's clinically dead and trying to revive them. So by actually uh, addressing uh, eight, uh, if you like, um, issues, they call, we call them the reversible causes. So if someone, uh, someone's heart stops, we think about four uh, issues that start, the, the, the spelling of them starts with an H, and we, we, we think about the other, one, other four that start with a T. 
So if we can address all those eight, i.e. four H's and four T's, and we still can't get any uh, output, i.e. the heart is not beating, we can't see the person breathing on their own or making any efforts to breathe on their own, then I'm afraid that's the end, unfortunately. But we do give everything humanly possible. However, you have people who have got advanced directives, who says, if my heart stops, you know, please don't start jumping on my, on my chest because I don't want that. And that can be approved by an attorney. And obviously that could be taken into consideration, but we need the original copy for that. There are people who, because of their existing conditions, we will then decide medically, not legally, medically, that we need to consider that. Would this be fruitful? So if the patient's heart stops, based on all the problems that they do have, the issues they have, is it actually humane to bring them back when they would not have any quality of life? You then have something you call a DNA CPR. That means do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If that is in place, it doesn't mean we're withdrawing the treatment. We can treat the patient as best we can. Uh, but if the heart stops, we will not be jumping on the chest because it, it, it would be futile, sadly. That's how it is. And the last one? I think it's around whether, you know, our, our community is suffering more because we're presenting late just because of the fear. Well, there is a point there. I'd agree with that. I mean, I'd say it's a very convoluted topic, that one, because there are times people, you know, don't have the right papers. They're not uh, naturalized. And so obviously they don't have GPs. They don't have the appropriate, you know, uh, documents or status to actually attend uh, the hospitals or approach the healthcare personnel because people are worried that they will be captured and repatriated and things. And so obviously people suffer in silence. The other thing is, we don't pay that much attention to our health as you know i'm sorry i have to say that but clearly um we things like the well man clinic they don't thrive and that's why they don't exist but the well woman clinic they exist they thrive because the women uh, you know bless them they are the ones that are really particularly concerned and very very astute and very attentive to their needs so they attend these things and you know they benefit from that because the nhs is free to access at any point but if you're worried about the status and maybe you have this idea that I don't want to bother anybody, well, clearly, if we don't know that you have this and you don't present yourself to our, our uh, doors, we can't help you. So I urge people, when you feel the symptoms, uh, there is 111 you can dial. And if needs be, these people who are at the other end will address that, would input your data and your symptoms and come up with a, a, a percentage. And that percentage will tell them whether you need to be in hospital or whether you can continue uh, to, 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 to self-isolate or shield. But it's important to remember that a stitch in time saves nine, and that's absolutely vital. If you can catch something now, it will prevent any complications later on. So monitor the symptoms. If you're not coping, they ring 111 and they, if necessary, would need you to 999 and the ambulance can come and pick you and bring you to hospital. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yeah, Kamara. There, there, there's a point raised because you touched on the PP, you know, a, a request possibly to have you back, you know, for a session with our healthcare workers because there are concerns about, you know, in this time, if we have agency staff going to work on the wards, and they may not have had the PPE fitted to them, is that going to put them more at risk? So there has been a request for us to have a session on, you know, PPE, and, and we'll try and get a lot of our nurses, you know, to join that as well. But yeah. we, it'd really be an honor. It'd be an honor to yeah. be able to help out wherever I can. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Dr. Kamara. I mean, next week, we're going to focus on mental health. We're going to have a, a GP, Diana, who was with us, you know, last week, and also a consultant psychiatrist, you know, from Avon and Wilshire Mental Health Partnership. So, you know, please invite others. We, the survey that Khan is launched, it's, you know, mental health is, is coming up as a big thing. So please join us next week, get your questions ready, and, you know, let's increase our knowledge levels because knowledge is power. So once again, you know, Dr. Kamara, we, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So bye, everyone. I mean, doctor talked about exercise on Tuesday between 1 and 2 o'clock. Doretta will be taking us through some 
exercises and and we're trying to record all these sessions so we'll post them on on youtube so you have you know links to you know the, the them as resources so thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the weekend we'll see you next week <laughs>